and welcome to the Best Bell Fantasy Podcast. We've got Theo Greminger in the house, Bradley Stalder, your host tonight. Theo and I are going to rip an FFPC draft. We're going to get started here in about a minute. But before we do, we have a word from Matt Kelly, the podfather himself. You know, people always ask me, hey, what is the, the World Series of Fantasy or the Super Bowl of Fantasy Football? And it's easy. It's the FFPC, the Fantasy Football Players Championship. It's a $6 million prize pool. And they've had their never too early best ball leagues cranking since February. And so the FFPC is the answer to so many questions. Hey, hey, where's the best place to get a dynasty orphan? Well, you can adopt a dynasty orphan at the FFPC. That's why we partner with them. If you want to play fantasy football for low, medium, high stakes, seasonal, best ball, dynasty, go to the FFPC. And don't forget, promo code UNDERWORLD to get you $25 off your first team. $25 off your first team, no matter what team it is, no matter what format it is, at the FFPC. Go do it. That's right. Use promo code UNDERWORLD. That'll get you $25 off your first league. Theo, we are underway here in this $125 best ball tournament. It's uh, $200,000 to the winner. One quarterback, two running backs. I think it's three wide receivers, tight end premium, as always, on FFPC. And Theo, we've drawn the ninth spot. But before we get into the strategy here, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. Last time I was on Best Bell Fantasy, we were talking best ball strategy, and now we're here. And now we're here, Bradley. It's June, and we're playing for a lot of money, $125 entry. I, I actually have another slow draft um, in this same tournament going with, with our friend Billy Muzio. Um, I'm hoping we run as pure as I'm running with Billy in that one, and I know we will. The nine hole is, is pretty fun. I think we're going to get exposure to uh, a few wide receivers we like. And also a few running backs we like. Yeah, looking at who might be available here, we're already seeing a, a couple players, in my opinion, fall a little bit. Uh, this is being recorded, so this is not a live. It is live for us, but it is not live when this is posted. So we're going to talk about a couple of players who are uh, available here. Uh, we've got Austin Eckler, Jonathan Taylor, Stefan Diggs, Saquon Barkley, Theo. Uh, Eckler goes off the board. I'm thinking, like, I know there's running back staring at us in the face, but, like, wide receiver seems to be, you know, something I'm, that... I'm that good with wide out as well. I, I like... I don't mind A.J. Brown here. I don't yep. mind Lamb. I can kind of defer to you because I think it's a pretty strong tier of guys. I've taken Amon Ross St. Brown here, which is a little high, but I've taken him here. Which way do you want to want to roll? I'm pretty open here, and I think it'll kind of guide what we do with the next few picks. Okay, so thinking of who can come back to us, like Stefan Diggs, do you think we can stack with Allen in the third round with how quarterbacks have been falling? You you never know how quarterbacks are going to run. You might see a run on them in the second round. I think you just take your best player and and, and uh, go from there, uh, whichever one you really, really want to bet on. You know what? Let's try Stefan Diggs. That's fine. Diggs is fine right here. I think Diggs is fine. I think there's nothing wrong with taking digs here. I know that some people were saying, oh, in the second half of the season, he was kind of falling off. I'm not so worried about that. He put up uh, very high floor numbers despite Josh Allen's elbow injuries. So I think that this is fine. And in the PPR where maybe it's DeAndre Hopkins lands there, I know you and Billy and, and you, a lot of people have chattered about what DeAndre Hopkins might do if he lands on the bills. I think it's just going to hurt. Gabriel Davis, I think, would hurt Kincaid. I don't think it would impact Diggs as much as, you know, a lot of, you know, chatter on Twitter has made it out to be. Yeah, I mean, the the one thing with Diggs is, is he's 29, but he doesn't really play older. You do worry about the older guys falling off the cliff at some point, and a lot of times it's rapid, and a lot of times it's kind of unexpected. Right. I don't think that's happening. I do think, like, Hopkins doesn't really hurt him, but it does limit the ceiling. Yes. Because, you know, we wouldn't get that insane target target year out of Diggs. Like the the idea of him getting 165 targets on the same offense with DeAndre Hopkins seems like, you know, incredibly optimistic. for us. I mean, but the, the bottom line is you got a wide receiver one. It's a foundational piece. We didn't lose the draft in the first round. And uh, we got a, we got a lot of bullets left here. Oh, we just saw Garrett Wilson go off at the 2-2. That's who I was kind of eyeing 
you know, here. But we also have Amon Ra, who we were talking well, about earlier. Well, I'll say this. I know you're not a huge fan of it. But if Bijan Robinson is here at the 204, Bradley, that's – that's I know. well, you're making a face right now. I know you're – Well, Bijan's, you're, uh, Bijan went off at 1-7. Oh, oh, never mind. I didn't see that one. I misread the board. Okay. Sorry about that one. It's all good. Amon Ra okay, so goes off, though, here. I mean, we De- Devontae Adams has been falling, but I I have concerns about him. I don't mind Devontae Adams. I don't mind Tony pushing Pop. up Jalen Waddle. To- Jalen Waddle, I like him. As I think an upside. I, play. I think Jalen Waddle's an upside play here, and it allows us to be, you know, very strong at wide receiver with two guys who can really, really win the week. And I don't think we're going to love what's that wide receiver in the next round because Olave will be gone. Devonta Smith will be gone. Devonta Adams. I think there will be, be running gone. backs for us to get in There'll round be a ton three. Of them. And Waddle last year was top ten in rate of top five weeks alongside Tyreek Hill. So I'm in favor of Jalen Waddle here over Devonte Adams. Even well, we have concerns about Jimmy Garoppolo right now, and you know we don't want to have necessarily two older wide receivers uh, on the same build. I am not an ageist when it comes to the wideout. I believe in some of these guys when they get to be over 30 years old. But at the same time, Jalen Waddles beat his ADP now for back-to-back seasons. We love Mike McDaniel. We know the target share is going to be there. Uh, he's a stud. He's an absolute stud. It's he's hit yeah. for both years, and and he's a fantastic player. Absolutely, and there's no defined wide receiver three on this team, so it's going to be a concentrated target share of Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddle. You know, maybe you'll sprinkle in some Braxton Berrios, but you know that's just me being, you know, optimistic for Berrios. But looking at like taking a step back and thinking, you know, as we go through this draft, what teams are we tying ourselves to? We're tying ourselves to the Bills. We're tying ourselves to the Miami Dolphins, and so I like that we can attack maybe Josh Allen in the third if he's there. And then Tua later as well. Tua was an upside quarterback in for many weeks, uh, so I wonder if that's you know a way we can go at this uh, at this draft looking forward for what type of uh, stacks we can get. We're we're certain, certainly fluid with the way that we can we can attack the quarterback position. I think if Allen's there at the three hundred nine, it's almost an auto pick for us. Yes, uh, but the fact that Mahomes is gone now in the middle of the second, I. I don't think that Allen will be there, and I also don't think Jalen Hurts will be there. So I think this is more likely, you know, exposure to the best positional player we can get. There's like a 10% chance Hawkinson falls to that spot, which also would be intriguing, but I think he'll be gone as well. Yeah, I mean, looking at the players who could be in that spot, you mentioned Hawkinson, T. Higgins could be there, Najee Harris, Jameer Gibbs. Uh, DK Metcalf. DK Metcalf is interesting because we're already very strong at wide receiver. We could keep building on that strength. Um, I think that we're, you know, if like when we start wide receiver, wide receiver, we're still open to pretty much going any way we want uh, in the third round. I think that a lot of people might try to, you know, take the foot off the gas and and try to fill positional needs. But if wide receiver is the best play here in the third round, I'm fine going triple tapping it. Yeah, T. Higgins looks a little early here at what was that, the two nine? I've yeah. seen him fall as far as like the three six, you know, in some spots. I was even gonna mention his name as a possible faller here, but that didn't happen. We see Tony Pollard and Derrick Henry go off the board. Both players I am in on for this year. If I'm at the the two three turn, I don't mind considering those running backs if I have that draft spot. Yeah, I mean, I love Pollard this year. I think Pollard's in a a fantastic spot, especially a best ball sense where you get those spike weeks. Um, He's, he's very, very dangerous for, for like the money weeks. Derek Henry. I don't know. I think it's a little early for him in this sort of setting. Again, he's an older player, older running backs. I worry about that a little bit. I also worry about during the money weeks, how he's going to be with that Tennessee offense, having a lot of question marks, being a a little bit potentially young at the quarterback position uh, as they finish the year with Levis. So I don't know. I, I'm uh, I'm not in love with Henry there. I like Henry a little more when he's in the third round. And that's fair. It's just that the big dog is is so hard to bet against. I mean, I bet against him last year and lost. You know, I thought that Derrick Henry was going to fall off. He had the injuries. You know, he's the five screws in his foot. We thought, I mean, Tennessee was bad last year, and Derrick Henry was still the number one running back in terms of top five weeks, rate of top five weeks. 
So he was still giving you quality weeks, even at his age. And I, I think he's built different, you know, than the other, than other running backs. He's able to last longer. I wonder if he's Adrian Peterson type, you know, he, he's still going to last into his early thirties. Uh, but I get it. You know, these running backs, when they fall off, they fall off hard. So unfortunately, Theo, as we I, get I, the into dream the, is dead, the dream is dead, but we have a, some nice options here. I, I put, we do. I put Ramondre Stevenson in the queue. I put Devonta Smith in the queue. I put Jalen Hurts in the queue. Yes. There goes Devonta Smith. Jalen Hurts at the – even though we don't have any any correlation, Jalen Hurts at the 309 is is very, very enticing. Um, Ramondre Stevenson, I think, is, is very strong there. Who else do you want to put in here? DK? You know, DK is interesting there. Um I don't know if I can pull the trigger on Jameer Gibbs quite there. And I know that there's t- people are torn on Brees Hall. I'm pro Brees Hall, uh, especially when we talk about the money weeks. But well, I Brees wonder... Hall here, though, Bradley, like Brees Hall, there was the, the discount. And now you're yeah. seeing in like the 350s, like the, the football, excuse me, the Fantasy Pros Players Championships, uh, Brees Hall's sliding up to like the 2-3 the turn. So yeah. I'm thinking that for this tournament, 309 is going to become a nice price for Brees Hall. I agree. Um, but gosh, if we can just get Jalen Hurts at the 309 here, this is like oh. an absolute, uh, you know, we're going to be thrilled Pants with that off. one. Pants off, Theo. <laughs> Who, so we, so you want to go Brees Hall ahead of, basically ahead of um, Najee yeah. Harris, ahead yeah. of, I'm trying to see if there's anybody else we should Travis throw in Travis Etienne, yes, I'll take Brees Hall ahead of him. Yeah, me too. I, I have some concerns there. I think we have the right three guys in the queue and we kind of let um, these other drafters decide for us. I'm, pr- I'm pretty sure that digital is thinking about, let's see who he's thinking about. Digital's thinking about going with Jalen hurts, but he doesn't want to, but he's like, I really, really should take him. He's yeah. I mean, Jalen, I Jalen hurts was the number one quarterback last year in terms of top five weeks by far. He had 52% of his weeks finishes top five quarterback the next closest was uh josh allen patrick mahomes at like 37 we're gonna each. get we're gonna get hurts here bradley because I think so that cat jackie well we just we're running pure tonight you got Jalen go. hurts here let's take Jalen hurts uh, this is fantastic getting Jalen hurts this late he could be the qb1 he could also be the qb1 by a lot if things land really really well and yes. that offense improves and the defense takes a step back Jalen hurts could like he could be QB one by 25, 30 points. Um, so I'm, I'm into, into Jalen hurts a lot. I think that this is just great value. Look at where we got hurts based on where Mahomes went, you know? Oh, absolutely. This is a, a massive win for team Bradley and Theo here yeah. in round three. And then that sets us up. I don't know uh, where Dallas Goddard necessarily is going. I, I, he probably could come back it's to no, us. It's no man's land, Bradley, because no, Dallas Goddard's going to go. He'll go around the four five turn, and we don't want to push him up. Did you get no. the hurts pick in? Uh, right now. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so that's that's just awesome to get a to get a three nine uh, Jalen Hurts, let's and go. we got and with Mahomes going off of the two oh five, and we get Hurts right there. That's just great. So I don't know. I don't think we'll have much correlation. We could build some sneaky correlation later on with uh, with DeAndre Swift if he falls to like that seventh. I don't yeah. think he will. He he could be a consideration to the six oh four depending on what happens at running back. Um, and then the thing about Hertz is you don't really need the correlation. He's just so you good on trap his own. Him naked for sure. Yeah. Naked Hertz is fine. So we're fine with that. And we're still open to Tua as our QB two. We, we just don't have to force it now. If Tua falls right. to a range we like, we can take him and we can shut it down at QB. Oh my gosh. Imagine Jalen Hertz and Tua at the right price. Shout out to uh, Connor O'Driscoll. Who's in this draft. Really, really great best ball drafter. Um, I wonder what he would think about when to take QB two uh, after a Jalen Hurts pick because you get the advantage of Hurts falling to you at a later spot. Um, you know that's I'll have to check Fantasy Mojo, but I'm I think this is probably pretty late for for Hurts in this tournament. So we're up next, and we can go any way except really quarterback here. Uh, we got Ken Walker, Amari Cooper, Aaron Jones, Debo, Calvin Ridley. <sighs> I've, I mean, I'm you always wanna, stuck. If, at, I'm always stuck at this spot between Calvin Ridley and Amari Cooper, frankly, because though those are two wide receivers. Like Ridley offers upside, but we haven't seen it in a year and a half. But Cooper fell off a little bit with Deshaun Watson. 
Are you I don't elsewhere? mind. I I don't mind Cooper. I don't mind Debo Samuel. I don't mind Kittle. I don't mind Goddard based on our build. I think all four of them make sense. Uh, there's not a potential high upside guy that we want to push up here. I think yeah. we're really looking at a veteran. Uh, it's a Mark Cooper. I think is the way to go. I, I like Cooper. I think Cooper Cooper gives us a little bit of uh, a little bit of coverage here at wide receiver. I think he, he's a good one to take. Let's let's take Cooper. Perfect. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I it's it's like a kind of an unsexy pick, but I think he's going to be good. And I also would uh, consider trying to take Elijah Moore with him yes. or another piece of Cleveland to kind of have a little bit of coverage. If he does take a step back, I think it means that another Cleveland uh, player has taken a step forward because I think that offense is going to score a lot of points. I, I think so too. And uh, the, the, I mean, they looked, the Cleveland offense looked good even with Jacoby Brissett. So it, the Deshaun Watson, who has a pedigree of top five quarterback performances, he has weak winning weeks back. He was in Houston, like the quarterback one overall, I think he had three or four finishes of that in 2021. Was that 2021? Yeah, way back when. Um, so I think that this is a, if the Browns get this right, this could be a huge pick for us. We could have three wide receiver ones on our team here, Theo. Yeah, I mean, Cooper was like wide receiver eight last year, and he was drafted so late. So I don't know if he's going to be a wide receiver one, but I think he's going to be a high-end wide receiver two. His, his home road splits are very, very bad. Like Amari, he, that's I think he, that's kind of a one reason why fantasy managers kind of get frustrated with him is he has the boom weeks and then we'll have weeks that you're just like, you know, shaking your head. But again, in these best ball type builds, we love those boom weeks. And we can put up with the with the weeks where he, he doesn't score quite as well because I think we're going to build wide receiver very, very, very strongly, especially with what we've done with Waddle and Diggs. And I see you've been adding a couple to the queue, a few players that I really do like that you've put in there. And if they come back to us at the right price, uh, smashing Christian Watson, Jerry Judy, and Dallas Goddard, all three of them, if any of those come back to us, like Goddard would be the stack, that makes sense. But I'm big into Christian Watson, a high A doc guy. We'd saw seen production last year. The Packers did bring in second round Jaden Reed, but I don't think he'll start hitting until the second half of the season. And it's just Watson and Dubs. So I, I like the Christian Watson add to the queue there. Yeah, I mean Watson at the five oh nine would be a smash. Uh he can go higher than this. Uh there's you know, some people concerned about the fact that the sample size was not that large. But, I mean, the guy looked fantastic last year, and I think he could be a 130-target guy uh, this year in Green Bay. He's, he's an explosive player, and I love those guys that actually look fast against NFL uh, players. Like, everybody's fast at wide receiver in the NFL, but Christian Watson looks like he was shot out of a cannon. Um, so I'm, I'm excited. It's, there's, a, there's a little bit of risk because we don't know what that offense is going to look like, but if he's there at the 509 – um, you know, it's a risk reward type thing. It's it's nothing but upside at the five hundred nine. Absolutely, and then getting Jerry Judy as well would be just beauty because we saw what Judy did in the weeks without, um, uh, without uh, with Russ Wilson, but without uh, Nathaniel Hackett at the end of the season, and he was just going berserk. I think it was what the last five six games he was the wide receiver six something like that. Like he can access elite ceilings. And when we're talking best ball, we don't care about the floors. We don't care about the averages, frankly. It's about what kind of upside can these players access and how often do they? And Jerry Judy has shown that he can last year with Russ. Uh, they bring in what second round Marvin Mims, but Cortland Sutton is just a guy, right? Yeah. And Sutton, I mean, I'm, I'm so unenthused about Cortland Sutton. Probably to my own detriment right now. Uh, yeah, so I'm I'm big into Jerry Judy this year. Uh, as long as he's healthy, he he can access those elite ceiling games that we saw. And they're in a division where they'll be challenged to do so as well. They play the Chiefs, they play the Chargers, you know, they play the Raiders who are bad, and they'll be able to take advantage there as well. So I like the divisional matchups in addition to Judy's profile. So Bradley, I put DeAndre Hopkins in the queue. Because I think at five oh nine, that's that's value, even though we don't know his landing spot. Are you down with some D hops? Oh, I'm so down with D hops. 
Okay, cool. So we have yeah. four guys in the queue, Christian Watson, Jerry Judy, Dallas Goddard, DeAndre Hopkins. I think that Dallas Goddard is a no-brainer with our structural build. If he's there at the 509, he's already a value. I took him in a football guy's like, or excuse me, a, a player's cha- a player's championship. I'm gonna, I am I need to stop saying football guys. I've done it like six times this offseason. The Fantasy Pros Players Championship. I took him at the end of the fourth round, which I don't love. Um, I feel like you lose an edge taking him there, but in the fifth, late fifth, I like it. Um, so Dallas Goddard's still there. Watson's still there. Jerry Judy's still there. And there are four picks to go and all, and three there. So Bradley, we just got to hold our breath here. and We're going to get one of these guys. Well, and looking who went ahead of those players, like give me Christian Watson and Jerry Judy and DeAndre Hopkins over Drake London, over DJ Moore. Like those are... Those are the edges that you want to take in your in your drafts, like identifying the type of players that can access. Drake London can't access the elite ceilings that we want for him. I even tweeted out today that Rondell Moore had a better per game fantasy output for you uh, if you drafted him in best ball last year than um, than Drake London. And it doesn't sound good, but like Drake London is on a run first team, low pass volume, competition with Kyle Pitts. I'm just not there for Drake London this year. So I put Rashad White, that would be a a 604 type pick, but we need to start having a contingency play here, Bradley, just in case we get snaked here, because I think we're going to. We lose Christian Watson. Right now we have Dallas Goddard. We have Rashad White. Where are you at on Miles Sanders, who I think is interesting as kind of a boring um, yet Got a guy I think is going to be okay this year in Carolina. I mean, I'd rather have Sanders than Rashad White. I think That's the Carolina fine. offense is going to be better That's than fine. Tampa. Yeah, like I'm okay with that. I, I I think that. Gosh, this is a weird spot. Yeah, we're a, just hoping a, that Dallas Goddard comes to us at this spot. Yeah, but I I think somebody's going to take him with one of these next two. I think we're going to get we're going to get killed on this one. Um. Maybe with this pick, but I don't know if he's going to go Kittle and then Goddard. Where are you at on Terry McLaurin? I don't I'm love okay, him, but I'm, I think I'm okay with McLaurin. Bad. Yeah, I think okay, it's okay as well. I think that's a good fallback. I think Godwin's an okay fallback, even though the quality of the offense is not there. I think we know that Godwin's going to be a big part of it. Or even uh, Michael Pittman. Do you hate Michael Pittman in this spot? I'm just not. Oh, yeah, we got Yeah, him. he's gone. I, I, so I don't know. I'm just unenthusiastic about Michael Pittman. I think we've seen what Michael Pittman is, and it's hard to think that he's going to have a better year this year. Um, I don't mind Pittman. I'd prefer Pittman if he was at the 604 than the 509. So we're here at the 509. We can... Do we look more like Darren Waller? Waller might lead in targets here. We can go Waller. I don't mind Waller. Waller would probably be okay. Um... I think this is fine, fine spot for Wall. It's kind of a – this is a flat tier for us. I don't know if we gain yeah. an edge with – I don't know if Sanders, White, McLaurin, Godwin, or Waller. I think Godwin, there's a Waller. drop from Waller to whoever the next tight end is, Evan Ingram. Yeah, I think that's that's fair. I just think that, you know, he's he's a little bit older, and we're asking him to get back to where he's been, he was, which always makes me a little bit nervous. But that's fine. Let's take some Waller here. I think Waller's okay. fine value here at the end of the fifth, and it definitely covers up uh, our need for a tight end. But again, I don't know. This whole tier, none of these guys seems like the kind of guy that's going to win you a best ball tournament, Bradley. I think no, it's kind of I like a, that's why this tier is is a little bit flat. It feels like Let's pick your guy, you know. Yeah. And, and I don't, I don't hate Cam Akers at this spot either. Here, Theo, if that's a guy that he split people, so I want to get your read on Cam Akers as well. Listen, I'm I'm not the biggest Cam Akers guy historically, but there's some parallels between Cam Akers this year and Josh Jacobs last year. They're getting drafted about the same time. They're they're both kind of like that that unsexy RB two slash RB three type. Uh, they're also they're also both heading into their fourth year. So Akers, like the guys behind him, are all sixth and seventh round picks and an undrafted free agent. So well, there you go. Right. This uh, Godwin's gone. Um, <laughs> so I don't know. I'm not. I'm not anti Acres. Again, I think this whole tier is solid right here, and I think we're wide open with with where we can go. We don't have like a running Swift, back yet. I like Cam Acres. I think those are the two we should look at. Well, I'm I'll, not. I'll say. I'll say. Make your case for Rashad White. Well, 
I think Rashad White's going to catch a ton of passes, and mm-hmm. I think that the volume's going to be there for him. So I'm a Rashad White guy, but again, we're splitting this team, so I want to be comfortable with this pick. I will say having some DeAndre Swift um, correlation with Hurts in a tournament setting like this could really help because we could we could catch them on the right week and really, really like the results. Um, I'll also go ahead and just for, for conversation's sake, I threw in Pittman, and I'm throwing in Christian Kirk just for conversation's sake. Um, but again, I think McLaurin – well, there he goes. I was going to yeah, say McLaurin's probably the pick if he's here. Um, again, it's still kind of flat. If you like Cam Akers, though, I think, and you want to stand for him, I think Cam Akers is fine here. I mean, it's Akers or Swift, and I think you made the case of the the correlation, probably unique correlation. You don't know how many people are going to be drafting Swift and Hertz together, and that might be actually unique. Well, we don't have any other real correlation. We could take Swift. We could take Swift here and have um, a, a double Philadelphia Eagles correlation. We also could take Michael Pittman here and have another wide receiver one, albeit kind of a less exciting one. Uh, I think either one's fine. I'm a, I would lean Swift, but again, yeah. if you like somebody else besides Swift, I'm I I don't want to talk you into him. Nope, I'm here for Swift. <laughs> okay, so I, let's take the I'm secretly Swift. a Swift stan, and I didn't want to make too hard of a case <laughs> for well, you. Listen, it's it's okay. It's okay. I'm never going to quit DeAndre Swift. I love DeAndre <laughs> Swift. And I think you have to be optimistic when you draft these teams, especially right. this time of year. It's like DeAndre Swift went from having to play uh, alongside David Montgomery and potentially Jameer Gibbs for like a day to having to play with Rashad Penny, Kenneth Gainwell, uh, and, and Boston Scott. So, I mean, this is the least amount of running back competition that, he, that he's had, certainly um, – you know, compared to what he would have in Detroit. And I get the the penny love. I, I think that they could they could end up being uh in a split. But again, DeAndre Swift is a guy who's always commanded targets. I know that's not something that Jalen Hurts has done historically, but DeAndre Swift has averaged over five targets a game in his career when he's on the field. So I don't know. The rubber's gonna meet the road, Bradley, and hopefully it leans our way. Well and DeAndre Swift last season over 10% of his finishes were top five weeks, which was 13th among running backs. So we're getting access, you know, high end top tier access historically to a player who was drafted in the early second, you know, who's found a new home of a team that maybe will use him a little bit better. You know, we do know the historical tendencies of rushing quarterbacks, not throw to the running backs, but maybe this is a keep defenses honest thing. And it's also, we saw what uh, Miles Sanders was able to do last year in this same Philadelphia offense. And so I think that uh, Swift is, uh, is, is a good pick here. I think he's a good anchor for us. Yeah. I mean, I've taken Swift a few times this, this off season. So I don't want to have too, too much of him. I took him earlier in the week in the draft against Billy, that hard way draft. Mm. Um, I got him in the sixth round there. I took him in a sixth round uh, in a draft with, <laughs> with Mike Shope. So I don't know. I guess I'm drafting too much DeAndre Swift. But again, I think he could be going higher when we get to the money money months. I think he could end up sliding into the, into the fifth round pretty early fifth because all it takes is a couple of news blurbs out of Philly or a little bit from Nick Sirianni talking about his role or even anybody in the Philadelphia organization saying that they need to target running backs more and Swift's going to see his value shoot up. We know the talent's there. We just need to, uh, you know, kind of ensure his role and his weekly usage. And, and he's going to be a, just based on the quality of the offense, I think he's a 14 point per game plus guy. And if it really, really clicks, he could be like a 16 point per game guy. I, I'm here for all the DeAndre Swift love. Let's take a peek at the queue. You've we still have Rashad White who hasn't gone off the board yet. James Conner, Traylon Burks, Brandon Ayuk. You know we. I remember a couple months ago when I had you on Best Bell Fantasy in the middle of the season, and we were talking about Brandon Ayuk, and he was rattling off you know low end wide receiver one weeks, but then you know I think he's he's just hurt by the existence of good quality players who are also on San Francisco. Like you have Kittle, you have McCaffrey, you have Debo. 
And if Brandon Ayuk was on any other team, like he'd be a bona fide wide receiver one, you know, for the, that team. And I think he would also be in the solid wide receiver two conversation. I just don't see how he can access, you know, the types of ceilings we want him to if he's, you know, stuck there. But I think if we at go 709, Ayuk, at 709, though, at 709, like, you know, that's for me, it's value there because you've seen the spike weeks with him. Uh, you've seen his ability to put up a big number. And I'll, I'll say that it's kind of like the range of outcomes here. Yes, there's other mouths to feed in, in San Francisco, but the offense could take a step forward. That's that's in the range of possibilities. And also, Ayuk has has shown that he can put up big weeks. Like maybe maybe they, they take another step forward with Ayuk's role. Because if you look at how he did last year, he had several weeks where he was just fantastic. So I believe in the talent, and I believe in the 49ers' ability to self-scout and get really, really good players the ball. So despite the fact that Debo's there, despite the fact that Kittle's there, seventh round Ayuk is the kind of play that you know you take to kind of win a league. Um, and we're certainly looking at that. So I don't know. I can understand your reservations, but I think seventh round Ayuk is, is, is really enticing. I, I don't mind Ayuk. I just want him at the right price. And I think there are also other wide receivers I like as well here. Uh, I'll mention Deontay Johnson. I think, you know, if you're talking about target hogs and an offense that could take a step forward, he's a player I'm considering. I'm also not out on Tyler Lockett at this spot. Um, those are two, two wide receivers that I think we could also consider here and see what happens. Well, what about my boy uh, Traylon Burks? That's my guy, Bradley. <laughs> you don't want to talk about him. You want to take an I old mean, guy over him. I mean, you were talking about the reservations you had for the Tennessee offense earlier, and you know, uh, granted, that's with Derrick Henry. But I mean, I get, I get the upside possibility of Traylon Burks. I'm also just concerned that this Tennessee offense will still stay bad. Well, I will say that if we just look at who Tennessee has at wide receiver right now, they could stay bad and Burks could have a 30% target share. So like the things you like about, I don't know, to me, Burks has the talent. He he is also going to be like his role in the offense this year as a second year player. Uh, it's looking good to me, Bradley. And if we think the Titans are bad, then they're going to have, you know, considerable games where they're trailing and Burks can end up being a, like 130 plus targets this year. So I don't know. I, I think Burks here at the 709 is an absolute smash, but I I'm splitting this team with you. I'm, I'm open to pretty much any of these three wide receivers. Um, and I also put Isaiah Pacheco in there because I think Pacheco has a pretty high touchdown upside in that offense at Kansas city. Um, where are you at on Pacheco? I wish I was higher on Pacheco because there were a lot of weeks where we saw, you know, 12, 15, 18 carries from him. And if he didn't get in the end zone was the problem. Like he was boom bust when it came to uh, fantasy scores. He had 0% top 10 rates. He was just a flex rate for you last year. Um, and so like, if I'm taking shots at like guys who could boom, like, I don't know. He's just not catching passes. Like I could see James cook take that step forward. Um, instead, I think Isaiah Pacheco is like a floor play. But well, you know, I'm not standing for, for Pacheco and I think he might be gone by the time we pick anyway, my lean would be Burks or Ayuk, but I'm open to any of these guys. There well, goes Burks. Goes off. Yeah. So Ayuk and Deontay Johnson are right there. Let's go ahead and take Pacheco out of the queue. Because I don't think you're into him. Um, I put the other two tight ends in Evan Ingram and Pat Fryermuth. It's kind of a tight end dead zone ish time where a lot of times you get guys not hitting. But I do think that Pat Fryermuth has some appeal here. I know we have Darren Waller, but we would have two, you know, very solid tight ends. And I think both have top five upside. And in this tight end premium scoring setting, I think that there's some appeal there. Uh, I do think that Deontay Johnson's becoming a little bit more appealing, though, Bradley, because the fact that wide receivers have gone bang, bang. Yes. And 
it's like after Deontay Jeffy. Johnson looking at the other wide receivers, it was oh so there goes Deontay, Deontay Johnson. I, I'm gonna throw what? out Jahan Dotson. Don't pushing hate him it. in there. Yeah, I don't hate that one. Because I just think that we could get steamrolled by the time we pick at 804. Uh if we shy away from wide receiver here, I think that there's a chance that like Addison's gone, Mike Evans gone, Tony yep. could be gone. So I think Dotson being pushed up. Uh I don't hate it. Dotson had a 40% flex rate last year, and that was, uh, I think, top 36. So I, I like that that pick. We could also risk it because Dotson's a little bit lower for some of these guys. Um, We could risk that Dotson will be their next pick, or we just take our chances here and, and just, just grab a wide receiver we like. Because, again, Dotson, I mean, it's I, kind of I, like a – it's kind of like a personal preference thing here for Dotson yep. where some people might have Evans, Addison, Tony right in that same uh, ballpark. I, I say we just take Dotson. And we really like him yep. and I'm comfortable with him and his upside. Perfect. Let's go cool, Dotson. Let's do it. And it, it really balances us out at wide receiver because we have uh, sort of the second year unknown upside with Dotson to go along with the two veterans in, in Cooper and Diggs and, and of course uh, Jalen Waddle. So we have really good wide receiver balance. Yes. Uh, I like your James Cook call. I think if James Cook's here at the 804, we grab him, and it gives us actually a little bit more Buffalo correlation to go with Diggs. We'd have yes. two pieces of that Buffalo offense. And, I mean, if it if if the ball rolls our way, we'd have the RB1 and the wide receiver one in the Buffalo offense, which could be pretty exciting. Um, you're a James Cook over – over uh, Damian Harris guy. There's been a bunch of Damian, Damian Harris guys I've, I've been listening to this summer. Uh, what do you think of, of their arguments? So I think that Damian Harris has a particular role. And I think that role is going to be the just ground and pound between the tackles, save Josh Allen a couple. And he has the touchdown upside. We saw that in New England. But, you know, he doesn't have the pass catching pedigree that James Cook does. And we saw Devin Singletary be like a high-end RB3, low-end RB2 as one of the worst pass catchers in the end, like out of the backfield, but was catching these dump-off passes to save Josh Allen. And with a player who is very efficient, like James Cook, catching passes, I could see that being, even if he just, he gets 8 to 10 carries a game and gets, you know, 4 catches a game we're talking about a player in P full ppr who's going to pay off you know over isaiah pacheco so no i'm i'm you know i think it's a no-brainer uh we just see pickens go he was also in our queue i say we take james cook uh we we build on our buffalo correlation i will just throw out to you it seems like a decent decent time to take tua if yes. we wanted to take Tua as our QB2 and have a very strong QB2 with correlation uh, to Waddle, this would be the time to, to take him. So if we take James Cook, we're saying goodbye to Tua. Um, I'm kind of okay either way. We both like James Cook. I am I could go that way. But if you did want to have a strong QB2 and have correlation, this would be the time to do it. I think what we can do here is look to who's going to be to us you know, in, in the ninth round. And I think we have plenty of running backs that I'm okay with taking as running back too. So why don't we okay. take Tua here to stack? Okay. So, okay and I think this that. will make us unique. I think this will be a pretty unique build to have uh, a Tua Hurts team. And it's interesting because I used to kind of be against, I, I think I used to think you lost your edge by taking QB two. If you'd taken a QB in like the first three rounds, I used to be one of those guys. But there's a lot of math behind it where like the pass-through rates in some of these big tournaments, you when you have a, a two, like two decent quarterbacks or two very good quarterbacks, a lot of times you pass through pretty well. It also allows us to completely punt QB the rest of the draft. And we Yeah, we don't need a QB3. QB. Yeah, we're skinny we at QB now. So we're done. We're shutting it down. Um, I like how we adjusted on the fly there, Bradley. I think it's hard to... Hard to pull the trigger there on QB2, but I think we're going to like, you know, a couple of two uh, waddle weeks. Um, but I think we just made it the biggest mistake of our lives, Bradley, because we do need a QB3 because we didn't look at the bye week. Oh, no. We, we need the bye week. Buys. 
Oh, amateur no. hour. You got to you uh, got to go scrub this one from the stream, man. Oh, uh, crud. I I was almost going to ask, "Oh, they don't have the same buy." And then pff, out of out of my head. But Well, we're going to we're going <laughs> to we can we can potentially we're, our QB our QB uh 3 would be, will be a last round QB or a second to last round if we do it. We can also punt week 10. I'm, I mean, I prefer not to, but yeah, I get so it. You know, that's, that's punt, the, punting week 10 would not be the worst. Like, again, it, it's it's really gross, but it is week 10. It's not a playoff week. Uh, it's not. And if we punted it, we punted it. But it is a little bit amateur hour. We didn't look at the bye week. So, uh, you, you know, know we maybe it's uh, maybe it's Sam Howell. I don't know how late Sam Howell is. Sam, Howell, Sam Howell, you know, he's not going to be an 18th rounder. Um, I know, but it's a one eighty six. Yeah, we can. PDP. So we've got to cover up. Um, we got to start game planning for the next pick. We've got to start thinking about running backs. Yes. We don't need to force it. Um, I think we're already probably a six running back build, maybe a five running back build. Um, team. I think being a, we're gonna be probably a little bit skinny at tight end if we don't if we don't take him uh, take one relatively soon um i don't think we want to be throwing darts at tight end in this format either no. i think we want to square up tight end and we want to square up running back um and that being said we want to be open if there's a wide receiver we absolutely love at the 909 i think we need to be open to that i'm going to put chig Conquo. or you already have him in there okay cool well no i threw a couple tight ends in there that i like I, but if you like well, chig i'm throwing out kincaid simply because we have digs and we'd have a little more correlation to, to the Buffalo offense. Yes. Um, it would not be the worst, worst idea. We see Gabe Davis going off the board. James cook is still sitting there, but we're not going to run that pure to get after the, the fantasy football gods are not going to allow him to fall to us after we took no. two week 10 by week quarterbacks. <laughs> no, that's, that's not going to be the case, but I did throw some other running backs in there as well. Uh, I think Alvin Kamara is an interesting eyebrow raise uh, going this late, given his upside. I know that they brought in Jamal Williams, and I know they brought in Kendry Miller, but if there's one more year of Alvin Kamara to be squeezed out, maybe it's a 10th round possibility. But... Well, A-Chain, Bradley, A-Chain, though, with our Miami correlation now and having A-Chain is the ninth round. The eighth round is sort of A-Chain land. So if A-Chain's there in the ninth round, he's definitely mm -hmm. a consideration. Where are you at on A-Chain? You seem to like to have a little bit of reservations about that that Miami running back spot. I do, because I think that there's for a, a while, it's going to be a three-headed monster. It's going to be Moser. It's going to be Wilson. It's going to be A-Chain for too long. And I mean, maybe it's A-Chain who does get you there in the playoffs. But I think that the Miami Dolphins do like Jeff Wilson as well. The at a chain is probably going to be splitting with Wilson and Mostert is it, he's liked in that organization, but we saw him have inconsistent weeks last year and he's also 30 years old. So I, I, I think that a chain is one that if we had like two solid running backs, we could like throw him in as a high upside. Like we don't have to worry about him starting for us. I don't know. But I think it's I think the fact that we have the correlation and I think his values there and you bring up the other running backs and kind of the unpredictability, but he's going to have some spike weeks. I think sure. is just too explosive. And, you know, we're, we're very strong. Two things we've done. We've we're very strong at wide receiver and we've shut down QB. So I do think that running back is going to be – we're going to have some appealing options coming up to us in the 10th and the 11th round. Yes. Uh, so I don't know. It's We can take – let's take James Cook if he's there at the 909 and then kind of have a conversation, continue this conversation. Yes. I'm kind of standing for him. Um, and I'll, I'll say that Samaje Piran is interesting at the 1004 if he's there. Uh, where are you I at on Piran? I think Piran is interesting. I agree with you. Um, I – uh, I am also interested in Brian Robinson as a floor play. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's Nelson Sousa is who I think is one of the best five drafters in, in the country is big on Brian Robinson. He came on first class fantasy with Billy yeah. Muzio and I, and it's been almost universal that there goes James Cook. It's been almost universal that if you talk to people 
they love Antonio Gibson of the two, but Sousa kind of opened my eyes a little bit to Brian Robinson. I don't know. It's um, he's so boring <laughs> to me. He is. I no, I don't disagree with that. But he's a player who will get. I mean, he two thirds of his games he got more than fifteen touches. Bradley, I don't know, man. I might start to pound the table for Devin A. Chain. We have that Miami correlation. Let me let me just say that to you like this. Let's say Tyreek Hill misses some time for Miami. A chain's usage could go wild. They could manufacture touches for him, and we have Waddle. I mean, that's how my mind works in these sort of tournaments. Is like take the really optimistic approach. Kamara's also like nine oh nine. Kamara is is super low. I'm gonna pull up in Fantasy Mojo. Shout out to Darren Armani, and let's see where these guys are going in the last few days. Yeah, Kamara feels low. Samaj P Ryan feels low. I mean, I was seeing P. Ryan in the 80s on DK. So, Maje P. Ryan goes off the board, running back 31. And, let's see. It seems about right, though, for Samaje P. Ryan. I, again, I, he's not, like you said, he's, it's not, I feel like we kind of lose our edge taking him. Well, Piran goes off the board anyways. So A Chain goes as running back 32, and Alvin Kamara goes. And as we get running snipe back. on A Chain. Doesn't matter, Theo. Okay, so I was looking at the wrong screen there, Bradley. So let's we can roll the dice on on Kamara being here, but the problem is with our fr fragility at running back, it's a little bit scary. I don't mind taking Kamara though. We might end Would up. Would you with rather dead bullet, just though. lock down tight end or no? We well, have this to is your back. if you want if you want Kincaid, this is the time to take him. I mean, Kincaid is going to go ahead should. of those three guys, 100%. I mean, then let's lock down tight end if that's the case. Okay, so let's take Kincaid, and we'll roll it on, on running back one more round. And then we build a little bit of Buffalo correlation. So we have multiple Eagles, we have multiple Dolphins, and we have multiple Buffalo Bills. Not the worst offenses to are back. Those are good offenses to tie yourself to, and I think that that's you know, part of the best ball – strategy is yes like correlations are important but it's also are you correlating to the right teams like if things go right you know we're talking about blow up games and we know that you know Miami and Buffalo meet each other and then you're looking at like a a DFS tournament you know so right now Kamara at the 1004 makes a lot of sense i i don't mind AJ Dillon uh, he's going off the board as running back 36 overall in this tournament. Kamara's going off as running back 33. Kamara goes at pick 101. So he usually goes right around A chain. So this is this is right about the time to take him. AJ Dillon is an underrated running back, and he goes off right there. Ugh, I okay. was gonna give my AJ Dillon spiel, but um I'm lit we're looking here at Kamara. I look, we talked about Charbonnet off air a few times, Theo. Is he going to get enough work to be one of the pillar pieces? Or I think we I, I just I just think you might be sitting on a bunch of five point games to start the year. That's what I think so too. So it's difficult for me to take him as the as the running back too. Do we take Damian that, Harris here? Damian Harris is not a bad play here. Um again, it's we're building a little bit more Buffalo correlation. Uh, we think that Damian Harris is going to, is going to have some, uh, you know, decent touchdown weeks. He's going off the board as, as running back 42. There's not a whole lot of an edge taking him here. I think that the move is probably to take Alvin Kamara Bradley. And I and know we'll it's see if Damian Harris comes back around to us. Yeah. I think Kamara, you know, the, the, the downside risk is gone a little bit by taking him in the 10th round. Yes. And what if he gets a, a four week suspension, a three week suspension? You can still, you survive know, absorb that. it. I, he, you can survive it enough. You, we'll, we'll absorb it. So if he's there, let's take him. Um, if not, I don't mind the Brian Robinson call. It's very, very boring. It's kind of gross. I know. <laughs> but again, with with the the firepower we put at wide receiver, uh, he's just just very very enticing. Tight end is flat right now. We, we have two of them. Let's 
just double checking our wide receivers. I mean, Jamison Williams, Elijah Moore, those kind oh. of guys are, are interesting for our correlation. And uh, Jamison Williams could be a potential hammer at the 10 oh, I'm, I'm adding him in the queue for sure. But so I think we take Alvin Kamara, though. I mean, it's, I think it's so. the, and I'll say that we we could potentially have a little bit of, uh, you know, I don't like doing it necessarily, but this doing it with this particular backfield, having a Kendra Miller, a Jamal Williams correlation with Alvin Kamara is not the worst idea. I don't what think are your thoughts on an 18 idea. and an 18 team? Like, I don't like rostering two running backs on the same team, but I did it a couple of years back with a Jonathan Taylor, Naheem Hines team, the team that did very, very well the year that they both hit it. I think there's, I think there's an argument to it. Yeah. I think the, the, he has the day to de- day to draft capital. His, Kendry Miller's comps were good enough. Like his profile was good enough. So I, I think drafting Alvin Kamara and then I, I'm not huge on Jamal Williams, but I get if there's some correlation there, I'm just, if, yeah, throw, throw Kendry Miller well, in the queue. 11th, 11th round, 11th round Williams. I feel like, you know, he's, he's a guy who's going to contribute on a weekly basis. I don't think that he's necessarily going to have the the sort of, you know, the sort of spike weeks we saw last year in Detroit. Um, right. But I think that there's going to be a lot of those weeks where Jamal Williams gets a, you know, 10 plus points and he's going to kind of help us for this build. And I think by drafting Alvin Kamara, we're taking ourselves out of the Jamison Williams sweepstakes because I don't know if we want two players that could potentially be suspended for four it, games. Plus we would, we would, uh, we would definitely have to uh, hold our breath. <laughs> um, for that Kamara suspension announcement, but yeah, uh, Jameson Williams goes off. Board yeah, anyways. thank you, thank you, Spring Hill Shepherders Five. That was nice of you to take him off the board. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a couple other players as we're scrolling down the board, a few other players that I've got an eye on that probably won't go. Hmm, where where is he? Uh, very late, Darnell Mooney. I like him as I know you're big into Jalen Warren as well. I think we make him I like a priority. I like him running back. We make, uh, and then Rondell Moore as well is at the one sixties. I think we can be aggressive with him. I, I like Rondell Moore in his role. I know that there's some concern about his size and injuries, but Rondell Moore is command. He's a commander of targets, regardless of, you know, whatever scheme is going to be drawn up. He was a good player at Purdue and he he's been good when he's been on the field. Yeah, it's uh, Rondo Moore's. You know, I like Rondo Moore a lot. I I do I do worry about how much they utilize the the slot wide receiver. I think Cliff Kingsbury was like the perfect offense for him, where there was four wide receivers on the field a lot. There was three wide receivers on the field all the time. I do worry about that changing a little bit this year, uh, especially with a with an offense that is lacks the quality, but. I really believe in the talent. I know you like Rondell Moore a lot. I know Billy Muzio likes Rondell Moore a lot. So I'm really open to it. I'm just trying to poke holes in what could be. Uh, you know, he's a smaller wide receiver. He needs to be put in a, in a position to win. Uh, he can't be out there on two wide receiver sets. So we're really banking on the fact that Arizona is going to be in three wide a lot, in four wide some. Uh, and I think that the 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 bull argument is – they could they could overcompensate for you know the the QBs they're going to have out there without Murray by getting getting Rondo more a few more low A dot targets and kind of just use him as a manufacturer. So I don't know. I think he's got a big range of outcomes, but I'm trying to poke some holes in it because I think a lot of really sharp people are on him, and I hate it when we all agree, Bradley. It makes me nervous. <laughs> it does make me nervous as well. <laughs> but uh, you know that's for later round. Like Chris Olave, Bradley. It's like Chris Olave. <laughs> Chris Olave, literally everyone you know that, that you think is smart likes Chris Olave. You don't find anybody who hates Chris Olave. I don't hate him. I guess I'm just not as excited as everyone else. Uh, well, that's probably the, the most negativity I've heard about Chris Olave in weeks, <laughs> Bradley. So thank you very much. Look, I, I have zero hate for Chris Olave. I just think we also need to be like realistic that, that Derek Carr is Derek Carr and Derek Carr has 
one of the lowest top five rates of quarterback scoring over the last Bradley, three years. Bradley, what's your thoughts on the on the Jake Ferguson pick right there? Uh, that's early. I think I don't know if this drafter autoed out because he has you know asterisks on the guys or he's I don't know what happened, but I'll say I like taking shots on Jake Ferguson because I think that's a tight end position where there's some like question marks on on Shoemaker and 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 Ferguson and, and, and I'll kind shot. of defer to the to the to the veteran. Well, I don't know. Do you, you think it's a three man? No, I think it. Well, I think I Ferguson think I think will get the two. first crack at it. Yeah. But it seems a, it seems just a little bit early right there. And uh, Theo, this is teeing up dangerously well for us for running back. It's, I know it's actually Penny, great. And it shows I know Rashad, you. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I know Rashad Penny just went off, but we've got Charbonnet, Herbert, Brian Robinson, Damian Harris, Jamal Williams, Kendry Miller, all like all there for us. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're taking the truly optimistic pick, it's Zach Charbonnet, and you're hoping uh, for you know Walker to miss some games, and and Charbonnet basically to do what Walker did last year. I, I think that there's Brian Robinson though, Bradley at the 1109. You liked him last pick, yes. So I think we take Brian Robinson, and I think well you're going to get Harris, Williams, Miller, or Charbonnet the next pick anyway. I think so too, especially given the tight end runs that we've seen. Good thing we took those tight ends earlier. Yeah, in these FFPC drafts, the tight end just gets just gets steamrolled. So Charbonnet goes, that that pick is gone. If Fat Cat Jet Fat Cat Jackie does not take Brian Robinson, I think we take him. Yes. I'm just triple checking wide receiver. I tight mean, end we got Lazard, Gerald Everett, Jacoby Gerald Myers. Everett's interesting. I, I don't hate Gerald Everett. But I'm also like Darren Waller and Dalton Kincaid have to be the tight ends that get us to the promised land. I think. Let's let's take Brian Robinson if he's there. I think it's it's exactly the kind of pick if, that you want to make in the eleventh round. Um, you know, it's a guy that you think is going to potentially contribute on a weekly basis, even though he lacks the spike weeks. We're going to get coverage. And it's a correlation like with Jahan Dotson. Yes, it's it's that Washington correlation that nobody really really wants, but we're going to get some. All right, hey, so I got Washington a question Mitchell for you. Interesting pick. So let's take Brian Robinson and not overthink it. I'll put this one in. Okay, nice you do. Quick. What is um, <laughs> what is um, your thoughts on Sam Howell? Because he may be a late round quarterback consideration, and I don't think he has our bye week that Jalen Hurts and Tua have. Well, that would just be complete. We we cannot take Matt Stafford because he's also a week ten bye week. That would just be the biggest uh, amateur move ever. I I'm cautiously optimistic about Washington quarterback returning decent value this year, like basically Howell. And then for deep, deep uh, best ball drafts, like a, like a real 28 rounder, Jacoby Brissett's a guy I love getting pieces of. And I have some dynasty, deep dynasty teams where I have both. I do wonder if how, how, how long his leash is, because if he comes out the, the season and does not produce, do they consider Brissett sooner than later? But I do think Howell, like we love Dotson. We like McLaurin a lot. I like both running backs and I like Eric Bieniemy. Um, and I like Eric Bieniemy with, I think this is his chance to get a head coaching job. So I think he's going to be pedal to the metal trying to do interesting things. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not completely out on Sam Howell, but again, you're betting on a late round pick, a day three guy, those kind of guys rarely hit at the QB spot. So I don't know. It's it's interesting, Bradley. Okay, so we've seen a couple running backs go off the board here. I think Kendra Miller is super interesting for us and our build yes. because he has – there's multiple paths for him. I'll also say Khalil Herbert, where I bet on Roshan Johnson often, but this is a good spot for Herbert. Yeah, I, I, well, Herbert's ADP is 102, and we're getting him in the 12th yeah. round. Yeah. It's it's these amb ambiguous uh, backfields, like people don't want to bet on them, and those are the ones that kind of pay off. So Khalil Herbert, to me, is, I don't know, it's as much as I, I don't mind, I would be interested in having a second uh, Saints running back. Like, I think Herbert, there's a little bit of risk because I do think Roshan – and Deonta Foreman are both, um, you know, options. But Herbert is the most experienced back in that in that offense. The coaching staff knows him, and he's had some very big games. And again, for best ball, Bradley, we don't need him to be good every single week. 
We just need him to have uh, some usable games. So I think Khalil Herbert is a, is a good catch up running back. If he's there. I think so too. I think he's a, a solid pick. yeah, I'll put it in for us. Uh, Khalil Herbert, because if we get wind that, Oh, Herbert's running with the first team, you know, or taking two thirds of the carries with the first team, you know, he, his ADP is going to bump up to, I mean, Samaj P Ryan level, right? Yeah. I mean, like Herbert was there and he's pulled back. I think that there's like, we like Roshan Johnson a lot, a player profiler, yes. and we really stand for him. But again, betting on a fourth round pick to, you know, really, really do it his, his rookie year, it, it happens. He could be this year's Damian Pierce. But for every Damian Pierce, there's two guys that don't really contribute. Isaiah Spiller, you know. Yeah. So I'm cautiously optimistic about our pick for Khalil Herbert. I've also kind of talked up Deonta Foreman and been laughed at. Uh, Billy thinks it's it's comical that Deonta Foreman um, is even in my 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 thought process. But he did run for, for 900 yards last year. So, Bradley, if you had to rank the Chicago Bears running backs in terms of who you think w- is going to be – the, the most fantasy viable, would you say Herbert one, Roshan two, Foreman three, or you somewhere else? Yeah, so I did do projections for Chicago, and my Bears projections have um, Herbert and Foreman split pretty closely, and then Roshan Johnson at a distant third. Um, I had Foreman actually leading the running back room in carries, but Herbert had 100. I have Foreman at 161, Herbert at 131. Uh, but I have Herbert as double the target share of Donta Foreman. So I think that there's pass game usage there for Khalil Herbert. And we've also seen, as you mentioned, the high end spike weeks, not just the Donta Foreman, oh, he's going to be, uh, his ceiling is like, running back six on a week because he had these uh, 35 carries and 150 yards and a touchdown like Khalil Herbert doesn't need all of that because he's a more efficient back as if we look on player profiler, his burst score is extremely high uh, is his burst or agility score extremely high. So he's a player that has special tools in his tool belt that can separate himself. And I like Roshan Johnson for the future, but 2023, I think it's, it's going to be hard for him to prove that he is the lead dog for sure ahead of Donta Foreman and Khalil Herbert. When, you know, you made the analogy last uh, earlier about uh, Damian Pierce and Pierce was just competing against Dario Gumbawale and Rex Burkhead. I mean, (laughs) it wasn't even close. So I think that there's the competition in Chicago is much fiercer and until we get news, like this is an ambiguous backfield. I think you can, can attack with some, uh, with some aggressiveness because there's uncertainty there. Yeah. And I think what's interesting is you, you bring up the spike weeks have been there last year. He had two 15 point games and he also had one game where he had 31 points, a, l- a little less than 31. Um, and that was in week three. And what's interesting is David Montgomery in his entire time in Chicago never had a 30-point uh, game in PPR. Well, so I always crazier, thought that was an Theo, stat. Was that game where he scored 30 points, David Montgomery left early. Montgomery yeah. got carries in that game. Yeah, that's Khalil wild. Her- it's wild. <laughs> Khalil Herbert was the running back one overall, you know, and he didn't even start. And you think about, like, David Montgomery had, you know, a few times where the fantasy playoffs he played so well. Um, and he never gave you that sort of immense spike week. It was to like David Montgomery would give you like two 20 point games in a row, but he never gave you that one, just like, you know, dominate your league type performance. And, and Khalil Herbert did it. So I don't know. Let's, I think, you know, if Herbert can just start the year off and give us six, seven starts out of this build, I think we're going to be okay. All right. Let's see here. So I what? put one tight end that I'm interested in, in Michael Mayer. I think yeah. he's interesting. Um, and then we obviously need to continue hitting running back. This I think Ty J. Spears have to, is interesting. Do we have to start kickers and defense in this one? No, this is slim. So we're oh, only we're, we're not taking kickers and defenses. Oh, perfect. Then we can definitely take a and later Bradley, round. Bradley, it won't even let you make the mistake to do it. It oh, doesn't even God. give you the option to take them. Oh, thank God. 
Yeah, they, they cover <laughs> up for user error here. <laughs> well, not the bi week user error. Sorry. That's Theo. right. That's right. And I will say for, for later on, um, Kenneth Gainwell should be in consideration because, again, he he's kind of like on his own little island, but we, we already have a double bet on Philly. And you're going to see a lot of um, stacks built between Jalen Hurts with Goddard and Jalen Hurts built with, with A.J. Brown, um, Devonta Smith. But I don't think you're necessarily going to see too many teams that have Jalen Hurts with um, – with Swift and also Gainwell. I think yeah. that could really like make us a little bit diverse in case they do decide to utilize their backs um, as pass catchers just a little bit more this year. And I'm looking at our running backs as well. We are not overlapping on any bye weeks and our wide receivers are also not overlapping on any bye weeks. Um, but our tight ends are, we're going to need a third tight end. Theo, we're going to take a third tight end anyway. I think mayor yeah. to me is very interesting. Just I'll say that Jacecki's a little bit interesting later, later, like a little bit later. We can't take Mayer. We can't take Mayer. He's by week 13. Oh, so they're all 13. Okay, I did not see that. Okay, I like I like Trey McBride. Yep, that's fine. I'm, I'm okay with McBride. Well, if you don't like McBride, I'm not going to stand for him. I just think that McBride, like, he's got a path in Arizona this year. Yep. Um, again, I was just not super him. impressed with him last year. It's just, like... A, a, at the right price, Trey McBride is is a pick, and he's going to get a starting role because Zach Ertz will be coming back from his ACL tear, and we have not heard a, a whimper, you know, from the Arizona Cardinals regarding, you know, Zach Ertz. And there's a new coach who didn't bring him in. New GM. I don't know. I think Ertz is. I think Ertz is is super banged up, and I think Ertz is getting super old. That's what I mean. Is that's why I I was really out on McBride earlier, but now that we haven't heard anything positive about Ertz like being on track to be well, ready for week Bradley, one I'll say this teams 10 and 11 both have two tight ends each or excuse me they have one tight end each so we should consider tight end here and not the 1404 yes um you know who I really like though here Theo Tyler Conklin I think it's a little early for Conklin. I think like for this, for the, like you don't need to take Conklin here. If you want Conklin, then then wait a little bit. Like, like I just see Conklin able... having a Robert Tunyon year with Aaron Rodgers is the thing. Yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm sort of more on the the younger tight end in in McBride. So right now we're at tight end twenty two with Everett. Tight twenty two tight ends have gone off the board. Yeah. So this is this is kind of the time to take. To, I, I'll, I'll say this: Mayor is going to be gone, but be, we're not taking Mayor because of the bye week. But actually, no, Bradley. Uh, actually, no, we can't take a fourth tight end because we might need that option for the yeah. uh, quarterback. So I, I think McBride's probably the pick here. Um, but I don't mind pushing it if you want. Well, who, who we don't. Have I like Tajay right. a little bit. I think Tajay's interesting. Yeah. But again, this is it's it's sort of flat. Um, I it think we sort of we flat. fill our positional need with 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 uh, Trey McBride. I would lean McBride. Yeah, let's let's go McBride. And then I have another player that uh, I have in mind. Uh, why don't we look at Darno Mooney here? If you want Mooney, I, I I don't know. I feel like he was like round fourteen. Darno Mooney feels like a value. Yeah. I, I think that that's fine. I mean, round 14, if you're standing for him, let's do it. I'll also throw out Peoples Jones as correlation. Oh. Um, we, can, <laughs> we, we can wait. We can wait. I'm just saying for later. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We can wait a while and and get get a little bit of correlation to that Cleveland wide receiver since we already have Amari Cooper. Um, I'm okay with, with, with uh, Mooney if that's your guy. Yeah, I think he just has the target share. He's got the efficiency metrics. If we expect the Bears to take a step forward, it's going to be DJ Moore. But maybe it's Darno Mooney, who's also going to be getting one-on-one -on -one coverages now. And he was the number four uh, win rate wide receiver last year in, against man coverage. So if you're if you're into Darno Mooney, we are here in the 14th round, Bradley. Get your guy. <laughs> it's get your guy season. <laughs> Look, um, Darno Mooney was Billy's guy last year, and <laughs> but, it did not work out so well for Billy. No, but um, let's that's see. Okay. 
And interesting, we did not see Michael Mayer go. But we can't take him. We can't take him. <laughs> no, we need to be disciplined. I mean, you you could make an argument that we that a fifth, a fifth wide receiver shuts it down um, because we're so strong and it's the FFCC where you start to. Um, okay, so the Dawson Knox goes, let's take your guy Mooney. I think that's fine. Darnell Mooney's fine value here. All right, let's do it. And you get your guy. Let's let's go. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay, so we get Mooney. Right. So it's interesting, Bradley, because you get to the – this is a unique competition because you have the two flexes, you have the two starting wide receivers, um, and it's tight end premium scoring with the, the 1.5 points per reception. Yes. Um, so you you don't need to be quite as wide receiver um, depth-wise as, as you see in certain best ball uh, formats. Yes. Where guys are trying to fill up like, you know, eight wide receivers or whatever. But I generally like drafting a little bit more wide receivers than necessary because you get those massive spike weeks if you hit on the right guys. Yes. But it's you can build different ways. That's why this tournament's so challenging. Oh, and the Darnell Mooney also gives us the Bears correlation, Khalil Herbert and uh, Darnell Mooney. Let's go, man. Let's go. <laughs> we are correlating to the T here. We are incredibly <laughs> correlated. Um, I will say Kenneth Gainwell, 15th round, really adds to our Philadelphia um, correlation, and it also yes. is a double play on DeAndre Swift. Uh, I think that both of those guys are just different than Rashad Penny. Um I think it's interesting. Like Kenneth Gainwell's had many fantasy viable weeks for Philadelphia. He seems like the kind of guy the coaching staff likes. He's not the kind of guy that's going to do it on a weekly basis, but um, the beautiful thing is we don't have to worry about which weeks to start him. Right. And he'll have a couple of, of big games. It happens every single year. And he's playing behind two running backs who have really struggled to stay healthy over the past few seasons. Like Rashad Penny, we know he's had the ACL injuries. DeAndre Swift has had the soft tissue issues every year in Detroit. So I, I think that Kenneth Gainwell could sprinkle in, and you mentioned it. Like We don't know when to start him, but that's the beauty of best ball is we know what Kenneth Gainwell can offer, and he can give us a couple flex weeks, and that's all we really need. Yeah, it's, um, you know, when you get down to this part of the draft, Bradley, it's, I, I like, I like having guys that are going to have floors, um, as, because I think a lot of people kind of swing for the fences in like 15th round and on where we really need to make sure that we're covering up and having depth and guys who have, you know, the ability to give us double digit points where they might not, you know, have those incredible, you know, games, but they are a kind of a reliable option for us. So I'm kind of looking at these these floor plays here, and and I think Gainwell's one of them. Um, we can let me also, throw in a couple of players into the queue here. Well, we'll I'm going to also say I'm also going to say Sam Howell um, because we have a little bit of Washington correlation, but we can really wait on that because Bryce Young's still available and Brock Purdy's, Purdy's still available, and I think both those guys are going to go ahead of Howell. I think so too. Um, okay, Jacecki goes off the board. Interesting that Michael Mayer is still there. What are He's your thoughts falling. on Mayer? He's been falling. Uh, over the last month, he fell 20 spots and underdog. And so I think we're seeing that happen here again. The, the uncertainty of the Las Vegas offense plus Austin Hooper, like, isn't just going to go away. You know? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I think that, again, Mayer is the kind of guy that I think will take over by the second half of the season. And especially in a format like this where it's tight end premium and you're seeing um, you know, teams drafting multiple tight ends, at this point in the draft, I think he's, he's, he's a really, really strong value because I think he could, by week seven or week eight, there he goes off the board. So I, team, team Hank Brutos BB, shout out for your Michael Mayer uh, 15th round uh, exposure. It's kind of nice. I just think you have to be – it's it, it's sort of like the Eric Ebron, Pat Fryermuth year where Ebron had it to start the year and all of a sudden you just see the takeover. Austin Hooper, you know, has been on a, a decent run. Last year in Tennessee, he, he didn't really offer us anything for fantasy. Um, but again, he got a decent target share. 
But how many teams is he on now, Bradley? I mean, at the end of the day, he's, he's a jag. He's bouncing around. And Michael Mayer, they took him in the top 40. And Michael Mayer was an excellent player in college. Um, so at the end of the day, I think that, that Mayer landed well. And I think he's going to be a really good Raider. And I think it'll happen before the end of the year. I don't think this is something you're going to – I don't think it's going to be like a Trey McBride situation where you're going to have to wait till next year and be like, well, we didn't see anything from Mayer last year because Austin Hooper came in and played so well. Yeah, I think it's a matter of when, not a matter of if, with regard to Michael Mayer. I agree with you there. Big Notre Dame guy, uh, but also... Is that your college team, Bradley? You root for (laughs) the Irish? Well, I went there, Theo. Oh, I did not know that. But you're yeah. you're so you're in Michigan. So you're you're uh, you're missing the old rivalry against the uh, the Wolverines. I bet. Uh, we I've gone to two Michigan Notre Dame games, so that's been pretty cool. That is awesome. That is awesome, man. That's uh, definitely yeah. I want to get to South Bend. I'd love to go to a game. I've never been. Um, it seems like something that would just be amazing. Both of them were blowouts, but one for each team. It was kind of disastrous when you know the, the Fighting Irish came to the big house and just got obliterated in the rain a couple of years ago. That was that was tough to swallow. But my wife is a big Michigan fan, and uh, and so there's the we have a banner in our front window: House Divided, Notre Dame, Michigan. It is like House a, Divided, man. It's a that is, that is the definition of a House Divided three foot by five foot flag that we just, you know, fly in our front window. Uh, Bradley, you see what's going on here in the 15th round. It's, it's handcuff time. This is is Kenneth Gainwell. If we want Gainwell, I think we don't risk it. I think we take him. And then maybe we come back around for Sam. Uh, Well, I think it's worth, I think it's worth a, a conversation here. I do think that it's, it's a very fragile build but I think we could shut it down at running back if we took game well and be just super thin and fragile. What are your thoughts on that? Or you want a life preserver running back in another round or two? I think I'll throw in one more running back after okay. we, we, after we take uh, Kenny gain well, cause we're at, up to how many running backs we would be at our fifth running back. So Kenny Gainwell would be our fifth. Kenny Gainwell will be running back five, and it's basically, you know. I'd rather have one we have more. Four I think point, six would we have be five. 4.75 4. running backs, since we can't count Alvin Kamara as a full running back because of the potential suspension. So we probably need a sixth running back. Let's, let's, and there goes my guy, DPJ. We didn't have to have that argument, uh, Bradley. Good, because I don't like him. <laughs> okay, so let's take Kenneth Gainwell. Okay. Yes, we'll take, we'll take Gainwell here. Okay, so we're down with Gainwell. So now we're at five running backs and we have uh, three Eagles. And that's great. I'm going to throw out, just to be super weird, there is a – let's look at one thing here. Um, Is there potential to build on Philadelphia uh, correlation a little bit uh, more? I I don't think we can because I think 18th round is difficult to go Quez Watkins or Zacchaeus. Yeah, no. Because I think they kind of offset each other, but that could be interesting. Like just for being unique, if I did, if we max entered this, I'd say let's take one of the one of the two uh, Eagles third receivers and hope that uh, you know that, that there's a, just a few spike week games where like Quez Watkins, I think that's in his range of outcomes, like what we've seen in the career. But I don't know. You can't bet on either of those guys, even in the 18th. So let me throw out a running back to you. He's not gone off yet. Uh, Gus Edwards. I mean, five I like yards it. of carry, dead like death taxes, and Gus Edwards gets five yards of carry. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't love it. I don't love it. I think that right now, if you want to have the edge, the edge. L- let's say this. I, I think that right now you're at the bottom of the barrel for QBs because Ritter and Howell and Mac Jones. And Baker Mayfield are the last. I mean, four. I'd rather go Howell. If yeah, we're well, go of course. I'm saying, I'm saying this is going to be the Howell time, because we have the correlation with uh, with Jahan Dotson, and we also have Brian Robinson. Um, and the QB position is so sketchy right now that I think beautiful Howell is going to be Howell. gone by the time we pick up the 17th. So let's take Howell. Yeah, because uh, other players that we like may be back. Yeah, and then I think that that opens us up um, to maybe a little bit of. Let me double check one thing. 
So I will say that Logan Thomas becomes a little bit interesting because I think that the tight end position is being completely ignored in Washington and nobody's drafting him. But I know I've thought about him too, but it, maybe it's Bates, maybe bit. it's someone else. Yeah, I mean Jonathan Bates is kind of not that good. And and Bradley, I'll say to you this: if Logan Thomas, if they, if Logan Thomas was not part of the plan this year, then wouldn't he have been a cut candidate and a guy that they'd moved on from? I like, thought just, he would have been. Yeah. <sighs> so that's yeah. that's interesting to me. It's just interesting because I feel like. A lot of times we see the early waiver wire tight end um, be fantasy viable. Like you brought up Conklin last year. He had a bunch of weeks like that. It's happened, you know, you think about the Dalton Schultzes in years past. And, you know, one of these guys that's sitting here that's being kind of ignored is definitely going to be fantasy viable. It happens every year at the tight end position. For whatever reason, it's the position where guys slip through the cracks. Um, Just throwing that one out there. We also should uh, talk about is there any more, you know, potential correlation for anything that we built? Um, I don't necessarily see anything that we need to force, but if it if it comes there, um, it's something we should consider. We've we've hit. I mean, is there a Miami long. wide receiver that you want? We've got a no. pick of Berrios, Anderson, Cedric Wilson. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of off those guys. Um, I think that that's difficult to uh, predict. I don't know. It's I think that that if you're gonna go really really silly with why with with Miami, it's Robbie Anderson, and I don't want to take him. But I'm saying no, that they brought him, they, they, they they he was terrible in Arizona, and they but they brought him in and they have like this weird wide receiver three on. Like if there's a guy that's gonna give you a couple spike weeks out of the 18th round, it's probably him. Um, I have I I want nothing to do with him. Um, Barrio Isaiah Hodgins Rick. is still out there, Theo. Isaiah Hodgins, my boy, league winner. When I was on the Goat District, remember? Yeah, no, I remember you were you were talking about the Hodgins train. That, that's uh, Hodgins is interesting. Darius Slayton's interesting in the 18th round. I mean, Slayton had a bunch of decent games last year. He did. Um, and you know, I don't know. We have we have Waller. I see you. You have Renfro in the queue. Not the worst play. Well. There's been a lot of chatter about Renfro not being on the Raiders come week one. And maybe we just, he could land in a place that needs a slot receiver. Yeah. I mean, he could also land poorly. If, if, if Renfro has gone, I've seen the reports too. I, again, I don't understand why they would wait this late to do it. That would be kind of my argument against. I'm okay with Hodgins. I like your, your Hodgins call. I just think that, like he looked very good last year. He had a, a a big a big playoff game, um, and I know they've added Waller and they added Jalen Hyatt, but, but he, he plays on the outside. Good. They yeah. they added a lot of slot guys. They added, I mean, they re-signed Sterling Harris Shepard. Campbell. Yeah, <laughs> all of the slots. Jameson Crowder even is on there. <laughs> so uh, just double checking a couple of things here. I mean, the, the end of the draft here is is a little a little sketchy always. I mean, Clay, Chase Claypool is still there. I don't mind spike weeks from him. Did Tyquan Thornton go off yet? No, I like uh, Thornton a lot. Let's double check that one. I overlooked him. No, he has been selected. He's he yeah. was selected. Okay. Um, I don't mind the Renfro pick. I think that Renfro like. I, it's boring, but again, in the 17th round, you want guys who are actually going to score and Renfro is right. not going to like completely disappear. I don't think so. I'm okay with Renfro. Where are you at on DJ shark in like the, in like the, the breakdown of the Carolina wide receivers? Uh, I like shark. I think he will probably play ahead of Mingo to start the season. I think that's yeah. going to be the, I think that's going to be the the role for him because Adam Thielen, I'm also banking on Adam Thielen not being very good in year one Carolina. So if it's if he's not going to work out, it's probably going to be Chark and Mingo who are going to be the two wide receivers. Chark just has trouble staying healthy is the thing. So I'm I'm good with I'm good with Renfro. I'm I'm also gonna throw out Van Jefferson. 
who I think is going to have a he, I think he's going to be on the field a ton for the Rams. And I think yeah, with he's Stafford once again back, one of those non sexy picks that you were talking about, but we were uh, seeing him run a lot of deep routes, and that's going to open up Cup. It's going to open up Tyler Higby, and that's what was missing, you know, in those weeks is Van Jefferson stretching the field. Yeah, I mean, they need Van Jefferson if you look at kind of what they have on that team. And and they really didn't challenge his role. Like, the, I think that they were linked to a bunch of guys and it just never happened. So, I don't know. Van, Van Jefferson versus Hunter Renfro. Um, and then I'll, I'll say, you know, a, a tight end four. It's very difficult to have three quarterbacks and, and four tight ends um, in an 18, 18 man uh, uh, build. But I don't know. And there goes Van Jefferson. I'll say, Bradley, if you if you have conviction on Renfro versus Hodgins, we can okay, go with so, one of those. So uh, Renfro has a career 23% flex rate. Um, so, so it's basically you have a little bit more of a sample size with Renfro. Renfro's had a wide receiver one season. Isaiah Hodgins has the tiniest sample size ever but he made do with his opportunities last year in New York. And they brought in a lot of other wide receivers too. Um, maybe we'll see if he comes back. Let's go with Renfro here. Let's take Renfro. Now I'm going to throw out for, for the 18th round here. I, I've, I've always liked to throw Pierre strong in because I think he's interesting. I think he's really interesting with um, the potential for a year two leap in usage. He's got the speed. He's got the receiving ability. Uh, he's just a, I think he's a dynamic player. And if he becomes uh, a thing in New England, he would really, really pay off here. Where are you at on strong? I don't think it's quite a dart throw. I think it's it's a calculated risk. I have no objection to Pierre Strong. He's definitely one of the players that I've been s- cycling through here at the end of these drafts. If people are very high in Ramondre Stevenson, then you should also be drafting Pierre Strong. That's the thing. So yeah, like it, the market that just doesn't fit. Like you, Pierre Strong should be up in the uh, 14th round, I think. I think that should be closer to where he should be priced. Frankly, I think that I think that sharp sharp people are are drafting Keontae Ingram, Pierre Strong. And Malik Davis of the of the Dallas Cowboys. Yeah, Those I like three Davis guys, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I I put Davis in the queue as well, just because I I think he's not going to be drafted that often in this tournament. Um, Pierre Strong will be drafted more often than than Malik Davis, but right now Malik Davis is the next man in in Dallas, and uh, you know Tony Pollard, for as great as he is, has never handled a massive massive amount of carries in any season of his career. So. Bradley, we are are pretty open here. I think we can eliminate Cedric Tillman, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. So Cedric Tillman's been eliminated. Um, I think we're gonna, as much as I would like to have a little bit more correlation there, I'm gonna take out Logan Thomas, even though I think he's good value. I like Pierre Strong. I like Malik Davis. I'm just not impressed with Keontae Ingram, but well, I'm not. I, yeah, I'm not standing for Ingram. I think that Ingram yeah. and Jerome like. Jerome Ford and and Keontae Ingram are two guys I really really like in yes. like managed because but I I think that in a twenty a twenty round uh, F, FFPC players championship draft like I love taking Keontae Ingram and I like taking Jerome Ford but I think Pierre Strong and Malik Davis have a little bit more of a chance of having kind of a weekly role um, whereas Keontae Ingram I think is a is a just a true handcuff and an appealing one though to to Connor. So Pierre Strong or Malik Davis, you seem to like both of these guys. Malik do, Davis is, yes. is a better offense. Um, Pierre Strong, I think, is is a better bet for for weekly usage. So Malik Davis, I don't know. I think we I'm, go with Pierre Strong here and see if Malik Davis comes back. All right, let's I'm take okay Pierre that. Strong. Uh, yeah, that's good. Let's take him. Good. Yep, got him. Excuse me, this is the 20th rounder. What am I saying with the 18th? Uh, I'm playing too much underdog here, Bradley. <laughs> let's, um, let's, uh, w- w- so we, we still have some other guys in play here. We do. Um, 
and this also, you know, the fact that we have a, the fact that we have a three quarterback build is not going to kill us now. No, that's um, why I was not opposed to, you know, getting Sam Howell as well when we did, because, you know, we expect him to be a starter. I think it'll also open up things a little bit more for Brian Robinson, given his mobility and it's patches us that by week that we, where are you at on tank Dell? Meh. Like I think I'm, I think I'm kind of in on tank Dell. I took him in the 20th round the other night um, in a, in a, like a managed, I don't know. I think they like him a lot. I think they really, really like him in Houston. I think he's going to be on the field a ton. Yeah, I. There's a another player that I'm trying to pull up the PFF stats because then I'll be able to speak to Tank Dell a little bit more. But uh, there's another wide receiver that I like really late and sprinkling in. We don't have to add him here. I just want to talk about him. Puka Nakua. You know, if we're talking about players who are stretching the field uh, in LA and this offense, you know, moving right along. Skoranek is not the answer as much as I wish that the Notre Dame guy would come through. Um, it's going to be cup. It's going to be Van Jefferson as the two. And then, I mean, Puka Nakua could easily step in and be uh, the, the wide receiver two slash three in an offense that we expect to bounce back here in 2023. He's just so slow. And I feel like it's hard to bet on the on the on the really late round wide receivers. Those guys like, just don't hit. Nakua was the number one uh, wide receiver in PFF receiving grade last year. Nakua was a sixth or seventh round pick, Bradley. Uh, sixth round. Sixth round. He was sixth so, round. So Our, I believe I believe that the only sixth round pick that has done anything of late is Donovan Peoples Jones, the guy who you don't like. <laughs> but I think all of the other six round picks have pretty much failed except for DPJ. Well, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just a it's just I don't know. You get I I, I got to get the dynasty mind out of out of you know the uh, dynasty brain put away for redraft season. That's fair. But you just can't bet on those guys. It, they just for whatever reason you never see these six round wide receivers hitting. And DPJ was like that kind of perfect storm of guy who was a big time recruit. Um, you know, fell fell through the cracks a little bit. He was there in the wrong years for Michigan. Michigan, yeah. And and uh, you know, he was, but he was a like a a blue chip recruit. So there was like some pedigree there. Puka Nakua played for two colleges. Like he transferred. Um, I don't know, and he ran so poorly in the forty yard dash. He was very slow in that forty. I don't disagree with you, it, Bradley. I'm going to put him there in the tw- for the for our twentieth round consideration. No, I- <laughs> Just, it's, just so we can keep the conversation going. It's okay. Uh, if we're looking at other running backs, though, I know you mentioned Malik Davis. I don't mind Malik Davis as he, if he comes back here, uh, but Evan Hull is an eyebrow raise. But he, so Evan Hull is to me just a, a true a true handcuff because I don't think they're going to mm. pass to the running backs. Malik Davis, though, like if if he, like Tony Pollard is fantastic. I took him at the two hundred five the other night. Yes. But again, he can't he he can't handle massive massive workload games week in week out. So I think Malik Davis is an outside shot of of having like a weekly role where most weeks it's going to be like six points, you know, eight points. But when you're getting a weekly role, like you know you're going to have a couple of decent games mixed in. And right now he's the direct backup to Pollard, so maybe Pollard doesn't hold up with a with a increased workload. So. Like Malik Davis has multiple pass, and I think he has more pass than Evan Hole. And he, Evan Hole's got to beat out Deion Jackson. I'm oh, betting on Evan Hole, yeah. but Bradley, Deion Jackson gave us a running back one overall week last year. <laughs> he most certainly did. Legend, legend. Check down Matt Ryan, check down King. It was, it was, but it was, it was amazing. It was like the, this is why I, I take time to put in waivers. It was like a, like a pat on the back for, for putting it in, you know, putting in the work. I was, uh, I, I think I had made a video the day before the Deion Jackson number one week. And I was like, pick up Deion Jackson, Jonathan Taylor's injured, blah, blah, blah. And, and, uh, I felt good about it because, you know, Deion Jackson, we don't know what he was going to bring at that point, but I made a video and, uh, it hit really well. It was a nice call by me. And you ran pure Bradley. Point, 
just the points, you know, it's, it, it's the points that they kept coming in and uh, the likes just kept coming in on the videos, Theo, you know, it's addicting to make these calls. So, <laughs> I mean, you feel great in your conviction when you make a call like that and you give somebody the QB one, you know? Absolutely. I mean, they're Absolutely. running back one, excuse me. Um, so I'm just looking at at the board here. No, I think we're for sure taking Malik Davis if he's here. It's a matter of what what is going to make us unique here in the 20th round, and I think that that's one point of consideration. I think you're already you're already you're already unique because like uniqueness is kind of out the window. We we have the we have the Hertz with the two running backs. That's unique. And we also have the Hertz to a combination, which I think is going to be very unique for this competition. Um, I think that Logan Thomas is interesting. I mm-hmm. think that taking the fourth tight end in this sort of a format could really, really help. Um, but there's also wide receiver options where we take another wide receiver here. I, I don't want to throw a dart though. I think we should, you know, we really, there's a few wide receivers that um, are interesting. Josh Palmer is interesting. We saw him catch 70 plus catches last year. Um, but I throw out my guy, Tank Dell. I think Tank Dell is a, a really interesting call here. Um, again, I took him the other night in the 20th. I think Tank Dell gonna... was wide receiver eight in PFF receiving grade uh, among 2023 wide receivers. I mean, the guy The guy is a day two pick, Bradley. Like Tank Dell, he landed in a spot where there's where it's unclear as to how the, the target pecking order is going to go. So let's let's game plan this shit. I mean, uh, or let's game theory it a little bit. Does Malik Davis fall to us if we wait here? Um, who's, the, who's more likely to go in the next few picks? Malik Davis or Tank Dell? Uh, I think Malik Davis is more likely to go. Maybe I'm reading it wrong, but I think I running think, backs are the are the hot thing here near the end. Yeah, Malik Davis is steaming up a little bit. I was in a draft the other night where uh, a very sharp player took him in the 14th. So I don't think the market's kind of like you know turned on Malik Davis. But let's 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 take him here. Let's not risk it. Um, so we took Malik Davis. Now we've got. Tank Dell would be my number one choice here in the 20th. Um, Logan Thomas would be two and Josh Palmer would be three. It comes down to structure here, Bradley. Do you want to take another wide out or do you, I mean, six wide receivers is a little bit thin, but again, with the format. Um, and we've I'm got, we went really wide receiver heavy at the beginning too. Yeah, I mean, and we're also can take the the outlook that if Waddle or Diggs goes down, we're probably cooked anyway. Right. So I lean Tank Dell here, but I could go Logan Thomas. I'll, I'll defer to you on this. Mm, I think the Logan Thomas gives us the correlation. But again, Tank how much? Dell, it, yeah. Tank Dell, though gives us the unknown upside that he could just win the job outright from Robert Woods and just it's clear that he's the slot guy, you know? Yeah, it's um the the organization has spoke glowingly about Tank Dell. Like they they think he's uh, like a, a a really really good player and again, he's the local product. The organization obviously knows him very well with the fact that they're they have a lot of people close to the University of Houston. Um so it seems like a guy that they've they've kind of banked on. Oh man, Bradley, I hate these kind of calls because I really wish we had a 21st round. Because I think <laughs> if our team was able to have Tank Dell and Logan Thomas, I'd like it a lot more. I don't think we're overlooking anybody else. I'm I'm just double checking the wide receivers. I'm double checking the running backs. I mean, I mean, maybe Marvin Jones, Billy's favorite. Yeah. I, but again, I he's you- He's he starts like if we're we're thinking Marvin Jones is like a bridge to Jamison Williams, right. so he loses a little bit of appeal. Like I want those guys that are crushing at the end of the year. That's how you. Win how about Deontay Harty, Buffalo? I, I think it's I think it's hopeful. I think it's a hopeful pick. I think oh. Tank Dell is a better bet than Hardy. Like I think Tank Dell is going to be on the field a lot. Tank Dell. I mean, there's a chance Tank Dell has hundred targets this year. I mean, we could let's go tank Dell. Let's go tank Dell. I'll make my uh, my case after we draft tank Dell for uh, Deontay Hardy. Make your case for Deontay Hardy. The wide receiver three role is wide open. 
they signed him to a non insignificant amount of money. And he was a top five wide receiver in yards per route run uh, back in 2021 on New Orleans. Well, Bradley, the judge has reached its verdict, and we'll say you did not sell me on Deontay Hardy. <laughs> um, what what would it have Shakir? taken? Khalil Shakir? Dalton I don't think he's that good. I don't think Shakir's that good. Up the, you also brought up the fact that James Cook in, in, the, in the Bradley – you know, range of outcomes, James Cook could end up being like running back 15 and they decide that they're going to, you know, really target him and make him part of the weekly game plan. I just think that Hardy is going to be like a, just another, you know, potential threat for, for Josh Allen. I don't think there's going to be a weekly role. You do make an argument, the fact that we have digs. So having a little Buffalo, Buffalo wide receiver correlation would have been kind of fun, but I don't know. I'm, I'm tank Dell is interesting though. Like I'm, I don't want to get myself standing for tank Dell because I think I could look really, really bad doing that. And it's funny because it's, it's a guy that I didn't draft any for my dynasty leagues. Right. But I think that he's got – like he's more of an appealing redraft guy than dynasty guy because he's a little bit older. He's an older wide receiver, and he's fallen into a situation where he could end up being the number one target on Houston. I, I don't think he will, but I think he that that is in the range of outcomes for him right now. I mean, he's 5'8", 165, Theo, and he ran a 4'4", yeah. four, four, 9". You talk about Puka Nakua running slow, right? Uh, I mean, well, my guy Tank Dell though has a lot more draft capital than Puka Nakua. So at the fair. end of the day, like the third round wide receivers don't really hit that often. Like of late, third round has been like where wide receivers come to die. But a lot of these wide receivers this year, we kind of like in the third round. Like your guy Josh Downs is in the third round, right? Um, Cedric Wilson's a third. I'm surprised round. I didn't. Uh, I'm surprised I didn't. Uh advocate more for josh downs in this draft but i well bradley you know he made our cue i think that you cannot have a bradley uh draft where josh downs is not in the queue at some point so at least he made our cue there was an on brown cue but we, we should have talked about him a little bit but Fair. like my thing with with tank dell is and I, again i don't want to be the guy who's like pounding the table for tank dell the has They're spent really, 10 minutes of this podcast <laughs> i know but it, again dell. you have nico, nico collins you have Robert Woods, who, like, I don't know. They bring in Robert Woods. He's dust. He's dust. He's dusty. And then Nico Collins, we keep waiting for him to make that big leap. And He's and a Michigan Nico guy, though. We know what the wide receiver development, you know, we know how Michigan develops their wide receivers, and it's bad. Yeah. You know? So it's Mechie or Dell. One of the two is going to be fantasy viable, I think, in some capacity in a low, low level. Um, so I'm taking shots on both those guys, especially in best ball. Um, and Met Mechie, like I'm betting on, I think he's interesting, but again, they just drafted tank Dell. This is the, the new coaching staff took a shot on him and Hey Bradley, we have tank Dell in the, in the, the 20th round. So go tank Dell. We do. we do. We do go tank Nathaniel Dell. <laughs> so I, I don't mind this build. I think it's interesting. I think that the Jalen hurts pick was great where we got him. I like our digs waddle start. Um, I'm I'm trying to think if there's any picks I would like to redo. The I'm Amari really... Cooper one was flat. Um, would we? Would well, Bradley? I'll say this: Would you have liked your team better if we took George Kittle in the fourth, and then went with? There's not really a great pivot no. there in the fifth, though. No, so, I'm happy yeah. with Darren yeah. Waller at the five nine, especially. You know, I felt like there was a huge teardrop. I mean, there was in this draft. You you don't see another tight end until Pat Fryermuth in the middle of round seven. Yeah, so, you're right about that. I like our I'm, Jahan Dotson pick a lot at, as wide receiver 36. Yes. Um, I like the discipline to take Tua um, because, you know, we like the idea of him and Waddle. And I don't like the fact that they both have, uh, you know, week 13 by. We're, we're banking on Sam Howell uh, holding that job and playing in week uh, 13. Hold on. Jalen Hurts... Uh, yeah, they both, they do. Sorry. I was looking at the wrong yeah. thing there. Yeah. So I'm going to double check and see where one thing on Mo fantasy mojo. Let's double check this and see the last five days. Yeah. So the last five days, Jalen hurts has been going off the board at 24 overall. Yeah. We got, so a, we nine, got a great value on spots. him right there. Yeah. Yeah. Got great value. And the low, uh, the maximum draft position, was 32 so we actually we got him at at 3.8 uh 3.9 
So we have the maximum draft position that he's gone in the last five days for this tournament. So we, we really we really got great value on that one. We did. Yeah, I like the how we started. We started strong with Diggs and Waddle. We've got upside. We've got floor with both of those wide receivers. They're tied to strong offenses. I mean, the core of our team is tied to good offenses. And yeah. we have a lot of correlation there as well. We fill in the gap of the week 10 because I don't think Sam Howell loses his job in the first nine weeks. Like if they move on from Sam Howell, it's probably going to be, oh, well, well, it's the Nick Foles, like week 13, week 14 sort of thing. Never say you- never, Bradley. Never <laughs> say never with, with, you know, with Sam Howell. But yeah, I, I agree with you. It's, it's more likely than not his team. I think they want Sam Howell to be good there. But again, Brissett is a capable backup. So I like what we did in the first half of the draft. I like the the, the Swift pick to go along with Hertz. Uh, I like the Dotson pick. The Kincaid pick was good. Um, and again, if we could have had AJ Dillon instead of Kincaid, we probably would have been trying to catch up at tight end a little bit more. So yeah. I think with Kincaid and McBride, we have two younger tight ends that that both could uh, kind of beat their ADP. Um, and I, I realized that we took Dalton Kincaid as tight end 12, but he still could definitely beat tight end 12. I think that he's really good, and I think he'll have some sp- some spike weeks there. Um, we need Waller to get back to being, you know, Waller-like. Uh, and, I mean, we got to have a couple of these running backs hit. We've really got to get something out of the Pierre Strong and Malik Davis. Even though that's our 18th and 19th round, we need one of those two guys to be um, at least a weekly touch guy. We can't, we can't have anything uh, besides that. And then uh, Khalil Herbert, that's an interesting one. Getting him in the 12th round, we got him as, as running back 43. I think that it's going to be – it's not out of the question that he beats RB 43 by 20 spots. He could be running back 23 for the year. Um, and I think that we, we got him with very good value. And the risk it was mitigated based on you know the fact that he was a 12th rounder and not a guy we took in like the, the 10th. Yeah, and looking at how we set up for the for the running backs, like Khalil Herbert could easily outproduce running back forty three. Brian Robinson could be running back twenty four. You know, he and just like consistently give you running back twenty four weeks over and over and over again, and that's what we need to just lock down the running back position when we have the upside possibility of Swift, the upside possibility of Camara. Maybe there's you know an injury to. Pollard or or Ramondre Stevenson we've got alternative handcuffs there that can fill in admirably so there's we've created a team with a strong core tied to good offenses and then there are also pathways for other contributors to make uh make moves and we also like the back end of the wide receivers are also going to like hold us up a little bit. You mentioned yeah. Jahan Dotson being a nice pick at 36 Darno Mooney at wide receiver 62. Like he could so easily outproduce that given the efficiency metrics he's put up over the last few years. And then, you know, your boy tank Dell could be a thing, but Hunter Renfro is also, you know, a, a player that has produced in the past and 25% of the time in his career, he's been good enough to give you, you know, flex worthy games. So I like what we, I, I really like what we did with our last six picks. I think that we, we gave ourselves and yeah, th- go ahead and throw Mooney in there. Our last seven picks. Um, I think we were able to, you know, maintain structure and also add a guys who I think could beat their ADP. So I, I, I like what we did. I think we got to run it back, Bradley. We got to run it back with another, another entry. Um, I'm down to do that very soon. That sounds like a great plan, Theo. For sure, man. All right. Well, this has been a lot of fun, Theo. I appreciate you jumping on with me. This is going to be posted. So we're drafting Sunday, June 4th. This will be posted on Tuesday, June 6th. So make sure you're checking it out. Make sure you are subscribed to the Player Profiler YouTube channel. Uh, Make sure you're following me on Twitter at FFStall. Make sure you're following Theo at TheOGFantasy. And uh, Theo, any last words? No, I'm excited to announce that Bradley's going to be putting out some articles on Player Profiler. Um, we're really excited to have Bradley as a writer for us as well. So uh, check out my written work and Bradley's written work on playerprofiler.com. We've got some really, really exciting um, articles coming out this summer 
We have a big staff of um, talented writers. We're doing some ex- some very interesting things with the expert series where we have a bunch of really, really successful high stakes uh, drafters um, and, and some people who have very unique takes um, and have won a ton of money uh, writing about their experience and trying to give some advice. We're going to call that the expert series. And then, uh, you know, I'm putting out articles. Bradley's putting out articles. Uh, we've got a lot going on um, besides the podcast side and besides the YouTube side. Um, so check us out at Player Profiler. And also the draft kit is coming out very, very soon. Uh, Bradley uh, wrote up uh, Ken Walker. And your second player, Bradley, was James Cook, I believe, right? Yes. James Cook. So if you want to hear Bradley's thoughts on Ken Walker and James Cook, um, and we have a lot of you know really, really great analysts who contributed to this. A lot of members of our staff contributed to it. Uh, it's going to be fantastic. So stick with us all summer and definitely check out what's coming out on the website as well. All right. On behalf of Theo, and I'm Bradley. Till next time, good luck in the best ball streets, everybody. Hey, I want to take a moment to thank you for tuning in. It's important to me that all of our media be free. This is only possible because of you allowing a true independent sports media enterprise to thrive unlike any other in the business. So please subscribe to the All In Package to continue to make all this possible to ensure that all of our stats, information, data, content is available to you, especially you, the people that get the site and get the show.